It's been just over a year since the end of the Tournament of Power, and so I think everybody's had a fair bit of time to sit down and think about whether or not they really liked Super. Now, I haven't talked about it in a while, but I was a pretty vocal critic of the series basically throughout its entire run, and I thought it would be a good idea to take another crack at it, not only because its return is right around the corner, but also because with most of those videos, I was making them in the heat of the moment in response to something that had just happened in the series. But now that the first run has come to an end, I can take a more comprehensive look at the whole thing without focusing too too much on certain aspects of it that some people may or may not really care about. Now in this video I'm going to do something unusual and start it off by talking about something that I actually really liked. So when I first watched this movie, I left the theater thinking that it was alright, but that it could be a lot better. I had a lot of problems with it that I thought held it back from being great. Then I watched it again and realized I was just being a big ol' poopy head because this movie is fucking incredible. Now after re-watching Broly and realizing that I had been too hard on it the first time I watched it, I worried that maybe I had done the same thing with Dragon Ball Super as a whole. So I watched some of its highlights again, some of the scenes that everybody agrees are among the best, and I didn't come away feeling the same way that I did about about the Broly movie. The movie's actually really, really good. It was everything I wanted it to be, to be honest. The plot is simple, and I mean that in a good way. It comes as a result of the movie knowing not to try and juggle too many characters and concepts at the same time. It has a really good antagonist. As a matter of fact, all of the characters included in the movie are written very well. The animation is consistently top-notch, with the exception of those weird 3D CGI Budokai models they used throughout the movie. Those sucked, but whenever they stuck with traditional 2D animation, it looked great. It was incredible incredibly well paced. I mean, there isn't really a single bad aspect of the movie. And the same can't be said for the Dragon Ball Super anime. It doesn't really do any of this well. Sometimes it checks off a few of these boxes, but never all of them at the same time. Now what it does well and where it screws up depends on which arc you're talking about, because each of them handles things pretty differently. So let's look at all of them one by one. So I'm gonna be honest, I don't have much to say about Battle of Gods. I think the movie is fantastic. Just take everything I said about the Broly movie and you could pretty much apply it to this one. Now, the anime retelling is a bit tougher to talk about, but I don't mind it that much. For a while, I didn't like it at all, and that's because I didn't think it was necessary, but over time, I've warmed up to it. I still think the movie is better, but I am willing to recognize that there are some things that the anime actually does better than the movie did. Of course, it doesn't look nearly as good, and the pacing can be a bit messy here and there, but overall, the arc is fine. Of the two movies that got turned into anime arcs, this one is without question the superior one. So let's just go ahead and... So when this movie first came out, I really enjoyed it, but the more time I spent thinking about it, the more issues I realized I had with it. Let's get all the dumb nerd shit out of the way first. I know a lot of people who like Super hate hearing about how wacky the power scaling is, but in this movie, it's about as blatant as it gets. The most obvious example is Frieza saying he can increase his power level to 1.3 million with sufficient training, and then when we are introduced to Shisami, it's said that he's about as strong as Zarbon and the Doria, but when he arrives on Earth, he's able to beat up Piccolo. This sort of weird dissonance between how strong you'd expect the characters to be and how strong they actually are is present throughout the whole movie. Now, on the subject of power levels, what the fuck is up with Frieza and his stupid four-month training regimen? I hate everything about this. First of all, I just do not buy that he was naturally as strong as he was on Namek. The series tries to justify this by saying that Frieza's a prodigy, but by this point, that doesn't fucking mean anything. Everyone's a prodigy. Goku's a prodigy, Vegeta's a prodigy, Prodigy, Goten and Trunks are prodigies, and then there's Gohan, the super prodigy. Even Gohan had to train before he could even come close to being as strong as Frieza, and typically he could only tap into his latent power whenever he got really mad or whenever he really needed to. Then, even still on top of that, we find out that not training makes Gohan weaker, yet we are expected to believe that despite never training a day in his life, Frieza was the strongest guy in the whole universe for a while. Okay, so I guess he's a super duper prodigy. Now, while I do think this is stupid, even setting aside any potential logical inconsistencies, this goes beyond me personally not liking it. There are a lot of things that either happened in Z or that were established in Z that contradict it to some extent. The first is that Frieza lost to Goku and it wasn't even a close fight. He got annihilated. But for some reason, he thought he could challenge Goku again and that he could win. So I always assumed that he'd put himself through rigorous training in preparation for their rematch, but apparently he just 
didn't even train at all. If this is true, then Freeze is just a fucking idiot. It's one thing for him to be arrogant, but this goes beyond the arrogance. He gave Goku, the guy who beat him up so viciously that he had to be rebuilt as a robot, an entire year to get stronger, and did nothing to make himself stronger. And somehow I'm supposed to believe that he's some one-of-a-kind prodigy and fighting genius. He was smart enough to run an entire galactic empire with minimal help. He was such a skilled fighter, and his natural understanding of ki was so impressive that he created three whole transformations to keep his power under control, developed multiple techniques like energy beams, his own version of the Kienzon, explosive energy orb, so on and so forth, could fight without using his hands, and he was a master of telekinesis, all without a single second of training, but he did not understand the basic principle that if he wanted to defeat someone who was more powerful than him, he would need to train. It never even occurred to him, no one on the ship said anything about it to him. Okay. It's also implied that he did train before, as he says that Goku was the only person who'd ever managed to hurt him in his final form aside from his father. While this is not concrete evidence that he and King Cold trained together, that's always how I interpreted it. Maybe it was just supposed to mean that his father was abusive, but in that case, why was Frieza just walking around in his final form? Also, if he was afraid of the appearance of a Super Saiyan, why would he wipe out half of his military by destroying Vegeta rather than just train? Why would he go to the trouble of gathering the Dragon Balls to become immortal if if he was truly confident that he was unbeatable. And that's the biggest problem I have with this. You could answer a lot of the questions raised by this plot point by simply saying, oh, well, he was just arrogant. He was full of himself. He didn't feel like he needed to train. But in that case, why would he go to all of the trouble of gathering the Dragon Balls and wishing for immortality? Then, of course, there is the fact that four months was all it took for him to eclipse the 10 plus years of progress made by Goku, Vegeta, and everyone else on Earth. What an arbitrary number, too. Four months, maybe I'd be more on board with it if it had been like a year or two years, but four months is absurd. And a series full of plot devices used to make characters more powerful in a short amount of time, surely someone somewhere could have thought of something better than this. But okay, I get it. Power levels are for nerds, blah blah blah. And to be fair, if this was my only issue with the movie, then I'd be fine with it. But there's still plenty more that I don't like about it. The pacing is weird and messy. Stuff just happens left and right, and you are given way too much information to take in. There are too many characters in the movie, and none of the story beats are given the right amount of time or focus. Some things take way longer than they should, like the fight with Frieza's army, and other things just happen out of fucking nowhere, like Super Saiyan Blue and Golden Frieza. Also, Golden Frieza sucks. Like, what a dumb, awful idea. Super Saiyan Blue is fine. I know opinions on it are split, so I'll leave my own thoughts on the form out of this video. But man, I have no problem saying that I just hate everything about Golden Frieza. It's a form that clearly exists for the sole purpose of selling toys and whatever other merch Toei can use it for. And on top of that, it's not even like the way it works is cool or unique. It is conceptually identical to his buff 100% form. When he first pulls it out, you think it might give him the edge he needs to keep up with, or maybe even beat Goku. But as the fight goes on, he starts getting weaker, his power starts falling because he's not used to fighting in the form. I mean, like, yeah, they're, they're the exact same thing. If he had to have a new transformation, I know they could have done better than this. Just look at Cooler. His final form is is fucking awesome. Certainly a lot better than just, oh, hey, we're gonna slap some gold spray paint on you. If this is what Cooler's fifth form had been, um, something tells me people wouldn't like him as much as they do. But uh, anyway, enough complaining about that. Like I was saying earlier, there are just way too many characters in this movie. And what strikes me as odd is none of them do anything worthwhile anyway. Frieza is just way too strong for everyone, even in his first form. So the movie becomes the Goku and Vegeta show. This is a bit annoying, and it would be one thing if the other characters weren't there, like in the Broly movie but they're included for no reason and all they do is waste time. We see them beat up a bunch of faceless soldiers and then we are told that they are hopelessly outclassed by Frieza even in his first form. Why even include them if that's how they're going to be treated? There are some cool moments from the fight with his army, but the fight with Frieza is definitely the best part of the movie. The thing is, by this point, it's hard to get seriously invested in it because of everything I've mentioned so far. It's hard to explain exactly what I mean, but all of these problems add up to create this feeling of illegitimacy. Like, nothing in the movie is actually actually happening because it can't happen. The beginning of the movie already messes up by fuddling the number of wishes Shenron can grant. According to this movie, it's two, even though it should be three. Then it throws all this stuff about Frieza never training a day in his life at you. Then you have to sit there and watch Roshi tear through hundreds of Frieza's men. Then Super Saiyan Blue gets pulled out of nowhere. Then right after that, Frieza transforms into Golden Frieza. On their own, these problems aren't that serious, but when they happen one after another, it's like I said. It also doesn't help that Beerus and Whis are standing right there the whole time. They completely eradicate 
any tension the movie may have otherwise had. I know they never actually plan on doing anything, but they totally could, and as a matter of fact, they do. This brings me to the ending, the infamous ending where Whis turns back time and Goku kills Frieza in Vegeta's place. Why is this here? Not only does the movie have Goku save the day again, it does this after setting up Vegeta's opportunity to do it for once. I would not care nearly as much about Goku being the one to defeat Frieza if not for how far out of its way the movie goes to make sure he does it. Goku gets taken out because of his own carelessness, and so Vegeta has to take care of Frieza in his place. And instead of allowing him to do it, the movie decides it would rather give Whis the ability to turn back time and have Goku blow up Frieza at the last second. Okay, fine. The movie hands Vegeta the kill, wrapped up all nice with a bow and everything, then robs him of it and gives it to Goku anyway. And this is all without mentioning all of the narrative thematic reasons Vegeta deserved to be the one to kill Frieza. I won't go over them here because I don't need to, everyone knows what they are. Whatever the case, the whole thing is just stupid. Now let's move on to the anime retelling. It has a lot of the same problems as the movie, except the quality of the art in animation is significantly worse. And the fight with Frieza, the only good part of the movie, is not as cool, not by a long shot. Now, what I can say for the anime version is that the pacing is nowhere near as bad as the movies is, not even close. Things are handled a lot better and with more care since more time can be allotted to certain aspects of the story. The most important way this affects the arc is that it gives us more time to watch Goku and Vegeta training with Whis, which makes their transformation into Super Saiyan Blue later in the arc feel less forced. We also get more insight into Frieza's training, which seems like it's supposed to make his power-up feel more earned, but at least in my opinion, it really doesn't. Four months is still four months, and it's still just as stupid as it was before. Anyway, spending more time on things the movie already should have spent more time on is about the only thing the anime does better. It does let us see some other characters that were missing from the movie, like Gotenks and Ginyu, but I don't think they add much to the arc aside from being cool inclusions. One major difference between the two that actually makes me mad is Piccolo's death. It's not the fact that he dies, it's how he dies. He jumps in front of an attack that's about to kill Gohan. Sound familiar? It should. It's a homage to Piccolo's death in the fight against Nappa, and it seems like it completely misses the fucking point of the the original scene. The entire reason it works is because it comes out of nowhere, it's the last thing you'd expect from Piccolo. But here he has an established relationship with Gohan, and we also know he is alive at the end of Dragon Ball Z, so it isn't even impactful or sad, it's just annoying. I don't think this should have happened at all, the movie or the anime retelling. I know the movie's success was a key reason for Super existing in the first place, but from a purely narrative perspective, this does nothing for Dragon Ball. Nothing has changed at the end of the movie aside from Goku and Vegeta's ability to use Super Saiyan Blue, but they didn't acquire the ability during their fight with Frieza. It happened off screen. And you know what? To tell you the truth, it would have been really cool if Super Saiyan Blue had been a surprise reveal in the Universe 6 tournament. Certainly would have been better than the way it was handled here. So if anything, this movie's and this arc's existence hurt the strength of the narrative more than they help it. Not just because of the Super Saiyan Blue thing, but also because it cheapens Frieza's character. His defeat on Namek was satisfying, and yeah, sure, him coming back worked at the beginning of the Cell arc, but that was because it was a surprise and it also hadn't already been done before. Here, you know he's coming back way before he shows up on Earth, and then he is easily defeated once again, which makes him feel like a joke. Yes, we get a cool fight out of it, but I don't think it was worth the narrative consequences. That could just be my opinion, though. All in all, it's a cool movie, and it's fun to watch, but I definitely think it has its fair share of problems. <laughs> So this arc seemed really promising at first. The initial chapters got me super excited because we had been waiting since Battle of Gods to see at least one of the 11 other universes Beerus had mentioned. And on top of that, the way this arc sets itself up is great. In the process of introducing us to everyone from Universe 6, it brings attention to all of these brand new concepts that I think fit the scope of Super very well. All of this was really exciting and it gave the series a sense of momentum that I don't think it's replicated since then. Even still, the arc did have some problems near the start. The pace was a bit slow, though I didn't mind this because most of what happened leading up to the tournament was pretty entertaining. Still, they don't even get to the tournament grounds until about halfway through the fourth episode of the arc, so it's really hard to go back and watch the whole arc from start to finish again. There's also the weird part where Goku and Vegeta go back into the time chamber, despite having used up all of their time inside already. I know the timer reset or something because Kami's temple was rebuilt, but I don't know. I still think it's strange. The real issues come from the tournament itself, though. This arc makes the same mistake as the last one, and that it includes multiple characters that just do not do anything on the good guys team. So once again, it devolves into the Goku and Vegeta show. Now, like I said in the Frieza arc section, this wouldn't bother me if the other members of the Universe 7 team weren't there in the first place. But the series tries to act like it's going to give the spotlight to other characters, and then it just doesn't. Monaka turns out to be a complete sham, and this would be kind of funny if the series hadn't spent this joke on Mr. Satan already. Boo was also a member of the team, and this had me pretty excited. I really wanted to get to see him fight, but the series just 
just doesn't let him. He is not allowed to enter the tournament because he fails a written test administered beforehand, so the only real members of the team end up being Goku, Vegeta, and Piccolo. Piccolo gets eliminated in one fight, what a surprise, and so then we end up with just Goku and Vegeta. Again. Neat. Now as far as the fights themselves, at no point in the tournament was I worried that anyone was going to lose, not until Hit was introduced. It is so incredibly obvious the entire time that he is the strongest person on Universe 6's team, and so I knew there was just absolutely no way Universe 7 would be wiped out before he got the fight. Also, the members of Universe 6's team, aside from Hit, are all so much weaker than Goku and Vegeta that it's not like you expect them to have much of a chance anyway. So all of the fights before we get to Hit are bogged down by this lack of urgency because we know the entire time how most of them will end. There is also the issue of animation. None of the fights are all that pretty to look at, and this isn't a huge issue, but it's there for sure. Aside from this, none of the fights are really terrible, but they're not great either. Goku vs. Botama was neat. It was reminiscent of some of the gag matches in the tournament arcs of early Dragon Ball. Just a quick fight against somebody with a fun gimmick. But there's not much more to it than that. The fight with Frost is fun for a while, and I think that's because I like his whole I'm Frieza, except I'm actually a good guy shtick. It's completely devoid of tension though, because we know Goku Goku can just transform into Super Saiyan Blue and beat him up. In terms of power, this guy is just Frieza, but without the ability to go golden, so we know he doesn't even have a shot at taking Goku out. This would be less of an issue if Resurrection F hadn't happened, like I said earlier. Up to this point, we still wouldn't know whether or not Goku and Vegeta can tap into their god key, and so it would not be too outlandish to assume that Frost can put up a good fight against Super Saiyan 1 Goku through some kind of extensive training or something. But we already know Goku can defeat Frieza, who should be much more powerful than Frost, so there is no reason to be worried here. With all this in mind, I think it's annoying that Goku gets eliminated. First, because it's entirely due to his own carelessness. Second, because it's pretty obvious that this isn't going to have any serious consequences. Like, is there anybody who really thought that both Piccolo and Vegito were going to lose to Frost? And then finally, because when Goku does get eliminated, we find out that Frost is secretly evil after all, and so he is basically just Frieza too. Well, we don't find this out immediately, but it is because Frost uses poison to defeat Goku, and the later Piccolo that we learn he is evil. Anyway, Frost vs. Piccolo sucks. The show acts like Piccolo is some genius strategist or something, but he does nothing indicative of this. He just teleports around charging up a single special beam cannon and makes clones and like whatever else. I mean, I guess that's a strategy to some extent, but it's not impressive or interesting. He just spends the whole time charging his special beam cannon then gets eliminated by Frost poison anyway. It's lame. I will admit the scene at the end where he catches Frost with his stretchy arm is cool, but I stand by everything else I said. Vegeta coming out and steamrolling Frost is satisfying, but man, his fights with Megeta and Kaba are so boring. The Kaba fight would have been better had his ability to go blue been revealed in the fight. It would have been a neat shock. More on that later, though. Anyway, Vegeta's match with Kaba also isn't tense in the slightest, because we find out immediately that Kaba can't even go Super Saiyan, so it's pretty clear from the get-go that Vegeta has it in the bag. I guess there's a bit of tension in his fight against Megeta. That fight's okay, but I had a feeling that Vegeta was going to win, if only because he he needed to stick around until the end of the tournament so he could lose to the strongest guy on the other team in order for Goku to step in and save the day like he always does. So let's just move on to the fight with Hit. Despite everything I said, I at least enjoyed the arc up to this point. Not a whole lot, but a little bit. But everything that happens after Hit steps into the ring is so stupid. Vegeta getting beaten up makes sense, I guess. This part of the fight is actually kinda cool. So what I should have said is everything that happens after Goku steps into the ring is dumb. How the fuck does he show up and start winning in base? after Vegeta got clobbered as a Super Saiyan Blue. I know this is a power scaling thing, but it's another really blatant example. Goku and Vegeta are about even, their transformations make them stronger, and Blue is their final form. There is no reason base Goku should be able to come halfway close to matching the performance of Super Saiyan Blue Vegeta. But not only does he do this, he does way better against Hit than Vegeta. It's also weird that Goku is able to block Hit's attacks over and over. I know how he does it, he blocks wherever he thinks Hit is going to attack in advance, but you would think that since Hit can fucking stop time, this wouldn't work. He should just be able to see Goku is attempting to block the attack he's about to do, and change his plan of attack accordingly. Then Hit starts getting stronger for no reason. I'm constantly improving, he says. That doesn't make any fucking sense. Like, well, you see, I never thought to get stronger before, but uh, I guess I should probably do that. So he does. He starts getting stronger just because Goku is stronger than him. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Anyway, then Goku pulls out the Kaioken and slaps it on top of Blue, which is cool, but there are some issues. At first, he says there is like a 90% chance he
he will die if he uses it, then he just laughs and decides he's gonna use it anyway. Then there's also how he says times 10, as in he's multiplying his power by 10, even though Beerus said angry Super Saiyan Vegeta was equal to about 10% of his power in Battle of Gods, 10 times 10 is of course 100, yet we are still expected to believe Goku is weaker than Beerus. I guess Beerus was just lying about his strength, but it's still annoying. Again, more power scaling, but this one is also really blatant. Anyway, Goku loses even after using the Kaioken, because Hit just keeps getting more and more powerful for no reason. And I guess that's supposed to be satisfying. The end of the arc is alright. We get to see Super Shenron, and Beerus doing a nice thing for his brother is cool. It adds dimensions to his character, which is always a good thing, but Beerus was already one of the best things about Super, so this didn't need to happen. All in all, I guess this arc is okay, but it really starts to fall apart towards the end. Even setting all the stuff with Hit aside, it's pretty forgettable, and there just isn't enough tension there. Like I've been saying, this arc would have benefited significantly had Resurrection F not happened. Having Super Saiyan Blue revealed to us out of nowhere would have been awesome, and would have made it more of a series landmark and less of a footnote. As it is, it just feels like setup for the Tournament of Power, and there isn't much reason to go back and watch it. <laughs> I've done my best to be fair to the other arcs and point out what I like about them, but I have nothing nice to say about any of this. Where do I even begin with this stupid piece of shit? There are so many things wrong with this arc that it really is difficult for me to pick a starting point. I guess I'll start with the premise. The synopsis of the arc makes it sound like fanfiction. Future Trunks comes back to the past to ask for help defeating... Evil Goku. This is obviously supposed to be fan service. I don't know whether it was Toriyama or if it was the staff at Toei, but someone somewhere decided that they were gonna do this fan fiction double whammy, and I guess nobody stopped them. Now, Future Trunks is a fan favorite character, so even though I have my own reasons for thinking he shouldn't return, I can at least understand the decision to include him in Super. But I never could have prepared myself for an evil Goku being the bad guy. Future Trunks and Mai are also implied to be a couple. Now, aside from being really funny and making it easy to compare the arc to fanfiction like I've been doing, this also doesn't make any sense. The whole reason Trunks and Mai were able to get together in the present is because the Pilaf gang were turned into children by the Dragon Balls. But there are no Dragon Balls in Trunks' timeline, so Mai should be... <laughs> Speaking of the differences between the two timelines, it's really weird to see that Goten and Trunks still look exactly the same as they did in the Boo arc. More distracting, though, is that Future Trunks has blue hair and Kid Trunks still has purple hair. I know the behind-the-scenes reason for Trunks' hair color change, but that still doesn't make it any less distracting and confusing. I would consider these things minor nitpicks if they were the only logical inconsistencies throughout the arc, but they are the first of many. A lot of things are said or demonstrated throughout this arc that just straight up do not make sense for one reason or another. The first is the whole Supreme Kai God of Destruction lifelink thing. While this technically makes sense since Shin isn't dead, all four other Supreme Kai were killed or absorbed by Majin Buu millions of years ago, so I guess we are meant to believe that the God of Destruction will only die if all of the Kaioshin are killed. This is the only thing that makes sense because Beerus was the one who sealed the old Kai in the Z-Sword, so he was God of Destruction long before Shin became a Supreme Kai. Okay, I guess. I could believe that, but why wasn't this clarified? Why did the series explicitly state that Beerus's life is linked to Shin's and not to every Kaioshin? Also, why does each other universe only have one Supreme Kai? None of them are referred to as the Grand Supreme Kai, just the Supreme Kai. It seems to me like this was an oversight because someone forgot that there used to be more Supreme Kai before they were all killed by Boo. You would think that if Beerus's life was connected to the lives of the Supreme Kai, that either he or Whis would have recognized Boo when they first came to Earth but they said absolutely nothing about him. This makes no sense at all. Someone would have told Beerus that four of the five Kaioshin throughout the universe had been killed by now. They would have had to, and they would have had to tell him about Boo. This raises the question of why he didn't just kill Boo and Bobbity in the first place, but even setting that aside, he or Whis should have recognized Boo on Earth. Speaking of Boo, this raises another issue with the entire concept. So since we've already established that Beerus's life cannot be linked specifically to Shin, that leaves us with two possibilities. One, his life is connected to the lives of all the Supreme Kai, and he only dies if all of them die, or two, his life is connected to the life of the Grand Supreme Kai specifically, and when the Grand Supreme Kai died, he passed his title and his life link with Beerus onto Shin. Neither of these makes sense, though, because the Grand Supreme Kai never died. Majin Buu absorbed him, and we know absorption is not the same thing as death, because when the people absorbed by Super Buu were extracted from inside of him, they were still alive. So the Grand Supreme Kai is technically still alive inside of Buu. Now, obviously, for some reason, him being absorbed 
attacked by Boo caused his life link with Beerus to either expire or latch onto Shin. But if that is the case, then why wasn't Beerus killed when Shin and Kibito fused into Kibito Shin? The specifics of their fusion were a bit different than those of Boo's absorption power, but both of these things are still magical unions of some kind. Even if you can come up with a way to explain all of this, there is still another problem. During the Boo saga, when Super Boo absorbed Gotenks, it became apparent almost immediately to Goku, Old Kai, and Shin that Gohan was going to be killed if he continued to fight Boo alone. This led to Old Kai offering Goku his Patara and suggesting that he and Gohan use Patara fusion to defeat Boo. Goku was dead at the time, however, and could not return to the world of the living because of this. And so, as a quick fix, Old Kai offered to transfer his life essence to Goku. In other words, die so Goku could be brought back to life. Then, with no hesitation at all, Shin offers his life in place of Old Kai's, and the only thing he says to explain why he is doing this is, I want to be useful too. Beerus is not once mentioned in this conversation. Old Kai tells Shin he shouldn't offer his life, not because it will kill Beerus, but because he is still young and has a long life ahead of him. I know this only happened because Beerus had not yet been conceived, but that doesn't change the fact that it still means it is basically impossible for the idea of Beerus's life being connected to that of the Kaioshin to make any sense at all. Maybe you can chalk this up to Shin being stupid or forgetful or whatever, but if the explanation is stupidity, then it is one of the most blatant instances of plot-induced stupidity I have ever seen. This guy is the overseer of the entire fucking universe, and so you would expect some amount of wisdom from him. But without even thinking, he offers up his own life, and Beerus is by proxy just so that he can feel like he contributed. On the subject of the Patara, let's talk about the retcon. I will discuss why I feel it was completely unnecessary later, but for now, let's just talk about why it's stupid. According to Old Kai, Patara fusion was permanent, but we find out here that this is only true if the fusees are gods. This means that when Vegito defused, it was not because of Boo's strange anatomy, but instead because the time limit expired. Now granted, it was a bit stupid that Vegito defused immediately inside of Boo while Gotenks did not, but you can chalk that up to a few things. Like, for one, that Vegito was not absorbed properly, and also that the Patara may work differently than the fusion dance. I don't like the retcon, though, because it tells the audience that Vegito just so happened to defuse at the precise moment he lowered his barrier inside of Boo, and that it was just a total coincidence. If that doesn't bother you, then hey, more power to you, I guess, but I think it's really stupid. Now, the real reason the retcon is a head-scratcher is because Old Kai implies that he has seen mortals fuse before with the Patara earrings. Goku asks if he and Gohan should be Super Saiyan before they fuse, and the Old Kai tells them no because they will remain Super Saiyan permanently, and it will dramatically shorten their lifespan. There is no way he can know this unless he had seen it demonstrated before. Maybe not with Saiyan specifically, but with another pair of mortals who use the Patara to fuse and could transform. The most important part of the statement is the bit about shortening your lifespan. Since gods are basically immortal, the fusion he is using as a reference point for this must have been between mortals, and so with these new Patara rules, that fusion should have ended. So the old Kai should have known better than to say Goku's fusion with Gohan would be permanent, but Whatever, I guess. Something else I wanted to talk about was Vegeta blowing up the time chamber from the inside. I know it's minor, but it's still really, really dumb. It just doesn't make any sense. It is a completely different plane of existence. I mean, I'm sure someone will try and make sense of it somehow, but even if it does make sense, why would he just destroy it? Seems unnecessary to me. Another minor thing is that apparently Goku has never kissed Chi-Chi before, even though they have two kids. I know it was supposed to be funny, but it still makes no sense at all. Then there is all of the time travel stuff. None of the stuff I have talked about so far is quite this bad. This is one of the cornerstones of the plot of the arc, and it just does not make any fucking sense at all. I don't even want to talk about this, but if I'm going to make my point, I have to. So according to an official Toei guide, the timeline Goku Black came from is the exact same as the present timeline, except for one difference. That difference being that in his timeline, Beerus does not kill him. So he manages to carry out his plan to kill Gowasu, steal the Patara and the Time Ring, wish to switch bodies with Goku, then kill Goku. Then he travels to future Trunks timeline, and events unfold like normal. Now here's the thing, this may not sound that bad, but when I say his timeline is the exact same, aside from that one difference, I mean it's a complete carbon copy. As in, Goku Black still travels back in time to fight Goku, Goku fights Zamasu, so on and so forth. They even hop back and forth between timelines and everything. So first of all, this is a paradox, and yeah, I get it, it's time travel. Paradoxes happen all the time in time travel stories, but this is just 
actually impossible. Goku Black has to exist in the first place for all of this to happen, but the entire reason he becomes Goku Black is because Goku Black traveled back in time to fight Goku. There had to be another Goku Black from another timeline somewhere in the equation, but there just fucking isn't one. Apparently, he just always existed forever permanently through all of time, so okay, whatever. Second of all, if everything happens the exact same right up until the point Beerus kills Zamasu, then why didn't he kill Zamasu in in Goku Black's timeline. As far as I understand, we are expected to believe that Goku, Beerus, and Whis watched Zamasu kill Goasu, then for some reason Beerus just decided not to kill him. Why? Some people have said that the alternate timeline is the one that happens after Whis uses his temporal do-over to rewind time, but that isn't true either. Whis rewinds time, he does not create separate branching timelines. But okay, since I know some people are going to insist that he does, let's pretend that he does for a second. In that case, there are two possibilities. The first is that when Whis rewinds time, he leaves a copy of himself and the people with him behind. In that case, why wouldn't Beerus just go and kill Zamasu anyway? Why would- I mean, sure, Goasu's already dead, but Zamasu is still guilty of killing the Supreme Kai. Beerus has plenty of reason to go kill him and stop him from carrying out the Zero Mortal Plan. The second possibility is that Whis does not leave a copy of himself and his companions behind, in which case it would be possible for Zamasu to kill Gawasu without consequences, but then there wouldn't be a Goku left behind in that timeline for him to switch bodies with so he couldn't become Goku Black. So yeah, the timeline stuff just doesn't make any sense. This baffles me because it could have been easily avoided. If Goku Black had come from a timeline completely distinct from the one inhabited by our main cast, none of this would be a problem. Then it would make sense for things to be different in his timeline. But as things are, I still don't understand why Beerus didn't kill him in his own timeline. In case some of you don't get what I'm trying to say since this whole time travel business is really fucking confusing. Let me explain what should have happened. Neither Trunks nor Goku Black travels to the present in the timeline Goku Black is from. Goku never fights Zamasu, so Beerus and Whis have no reason to be suspicious of him, but somehow Zamasu still learns about the Super Dragon Balls on GodTube or whatever, and still finds out that Goku and Vegeta are mortals with godlike power who are far stronger than him. Things proceed as normal and none of the stupid time paradox nonsense is a problem anymore. Of course, there would still be the problem of Zamasu himself. What a horrible character. I hate him so much. What a piece of shit villain. Everything about him from his motivation to his personality to every piece of dialogue he has just fucking sucks. And what irritates me the most about him is that the framework for an incredible character is there. He easily could have been the best antagonist in all of Dragon Ball, but this is super, so of course we can't have nice things. Now the idea of a god who is actually a horrible genocidal maniac is really cool. The fact the fact that he thinks he is righteous even though he is a heartless monster is a neat idea and something I can totally get on board with. But his character arc isn't handled well enough for any of it to work as intended. Zamasu's turning point comes when he sees a rock man kick another rock man a few times. That is what fucking sets him off. He sees this one event and decides it's time to wipe out all life in the universe. Are you kidding me? You know what would have been cool? If he had been the viewpoint character for a few episodes. We see Zamasu travel all across the universe so he can decide how he should fix it, and at first, maybe Maybe he approaches it benevolently. He approaches it with the intention of genuinely fixing all of the problems afflicting mortal life, and decides to live among various mortal civilizations for a short time to figure out how he can help. Something like that. Maybe we even see him helping out a few people in need or whatever to make us like him. But throughout his travels, he just sees so much fucked up shit that it breaks him. He's sheltered, his life has been a good one, and he's never been exposed to war or genocide or any of the other atrocities he would no doubt come across. And after enough of it, he decides to take matters into his own hands, wipe the universe clean of human life, and start fresh. Maybe that's not perfect, but... I mean, that would have been a lot better than what we got, because instead of all of this, he sees a fucking rock man get kicked a few times, and like, really, that's it? Sure, fine, great awesome character. His attitude and his dialogue sucks as well. Every time he opens his mouth, I want to punch him in the throat. Mortals, this, gods, that, blah blah blah. Every line he has is talking about how great he is and how evil mortals are. Like, okay dude, your shtick would be fine if you didn't say the exact same fucking thing every time you speak. And despite his unique premise, he doesn't have a unique personality. He acts just like every other villain we've seen in Dragon Ball. He talks down to people, monologues, gets mad when he thinks he's going to lose. Also, he's a moron. 
We learned that before he made his wish to become Goku Black, he met with Zuno to ask about the Super Dragon Balls. He basically held Zuno at gunpoint and demanded to be told about the Super Dragon Balls, but that was it. What the fuck? Zamasu, you're threatening to kill him. You have infinite questions. Ask who you should change bodies with. Ask how you can become more powerful than anyone in the multiverse. Ask if you will succeed if you proceed with your plan. Ask if there are other Dragon Balls. That way you don't have to gather the fucking Super Dragon Balls just to become immortal. God, there are so many things he could have asked about that would have just made his plan so much more airtight. Imagine if he had asked about warriors more powerful than Goku and had learned about Jiren. Jiren Black would have been a fucking problem, but whatever, he's stupid and only asks about the Dragon Balls. Fine, whatever, I guess. Granted, most of the characters in this arc are written poorly. A lot of them are flat and talk like children, few if any of the lines are good, and if I had to pick a character aside from Zamasu to focus on for this point, it would be Trunks. Future Trunks spends the whole arc arguing with Zamasu about how great mortals actually are and how good teamwork and friendship are blah blah blah. Like half of his lines are just telling Zamasu, no nah, man, you're, you're wrong. Mortals are actually cool. Like, why do you feel the need to argue with this obviously insane person? I don't know if Trunks thinks that he is going to change Zamasu's mind, or if he just thinks he's being really cool and heroic, but either one is annoying. I'm already kind of sick of talking about this arc though, so I'm not going to spend very long complaining about Trunks. Instead, let's just talk about that scene at the end. You know exactly which one I'm talking about. Trunks performs the spirit bomb, absorbs it into his sword, and cuts Zamasu in half. Vegito couldn't defeat Zamasu, but Trunks manages it in a few seconds. Say what you want about how it's narratively satisfying, or how he deserved it, or whatever, but it's fucking stupid. It doesn't make any sense. How did he learn the spirit bomb? How did he hit Zamasu in the first place? How is the energy of like 30 people enough to defeat Zamasu when Kid Buu pushed back a spirit bomb packed with energy from everyone on Earth? If they wanted Trunks to be the one to defeat Zamasu, then they should have figured out a belief way to pull it off. But instead, they just throw logic to the wayside and give him the most fanfiction bullshit Gary Stu moment I've ever seen in my entire fucking life. One of the reasons this irks me more than anything is because of how Vegito was treated. Vegito had every right to take Zamasu out here, but he just shows up and accomplishes nothing. And the Patara retcon was absolutely unnecessary, by the way. They established literally one arc prior that the Dragon Balls could be used to defuse people fused with the Patara, but apparently we needed the retcon in Anyway, if they really wanted him to defuse in the middle of the fight just so Trunks could get his stupid spirit sword, then they could have said the Universe 10 Patara were different or something. But they retcon it for no fucking reason. Not that any of it matters anyway, everything gets solved by a deus ex machina at the end when Zeno comes in and destroys Universe 7 altogether. The Patara thing is not the only example of this arc taking something that was set up to be useful later and completely disregarding it. It decides to make a big deal out of the Mafuba and treats it as the main cast's trump card and then it doesn't end up accomplishing anything. If they wanted Trunks to beat Zamasu, then they could have just had him seal Zamasu with the Mafuba, but no. Instead, they retcon the Protara, have Trunks perform the Spirit Bomb, and summon Zeno to save the day. None of it was necessary at all. Anyway, I'm sick of talking about this arc, so even though I have plenty more to complain about, this will be the last thing I go over. Super Saiyan Rosé and Super Saiyan Rage. Rosé is fine, I guess. Like, we already got red Super Saiyan, blue Super Saiyan, and yellow Super Saiyan, but sure, I guess we can just add another color into the mix, because why not? We want to sell toys. It is functionally identical to Super Saiyan Blue, but I guess it looks cool and the difference is only aesthetic, so fine, whatever, it can have a pass but Super Saiyan Rage is so stupid. Why does Trunks have this whole entire transformation exclusive to him? It just strengthens the fanfic point that I made earlier. Like, if he didn't already feel like enough of a Gary Stu, well, here you go. Here's another reason why he's a shitty, bad fanfic character. I mean, I guess it was necessary because the writers needed some reason for him to jump from being weaker than base black to being as strong as fused Zamasu in, like, a week? So fuck it, whatever. I, I guess it's fine too. Like I said, I have so much more to say about this arc, but if I kept going, we'd be here all day, and I think everybody gets the idea. What I will say is, if you're just here for the action, and all of this stuff not making sense or just being poorly put together doesn't bother you, then you'll enjoy this arc a ton, and you'll probably get a lot out of it. But I can't stand it. I think it's one of the worst in all of Dragon Ball. So this is by far the longest arc in the series, at least so far, but I have surprisingly few words for it. I think that's because a lot of it is just forgettable. There 
is a lot of cool, memorable stuff in the arc, though. I'll give it that. Goku versus Jiren round one is one of my favorite fights in Dragon Ball. Some of the side characters like Seventeen and Frieza are consistently entertaining. We get introduced to a ton of new characters. There's just a lot to like. But it's all spread out so far apart, and when the arc isn't at its best, it's so boring. I mean, it's really fucking boring. And that's because there's so much talking. All of the fights are interrupted by multiple consecutive minutes of characters talking to each other, and it's completely unnecessary. They're all pointing stuff out to the viewer that they should already know. Oh wow, Kef was fast, but Goku's even faster. His reflexes are just too much for her. She'll never be able to hit him. Yeah, I can see that already, thanks. I didn't need to be told that. The characters just constantly spit stuff out that the viewer should already know, but they don't bother to explain any of the stuff that doesn't make sense. Speaking of, this arc has a lot of the same problems as the other. Stuff happens that doesn't make any sense. Previously established ideas are contradicted left and right. You get the picture. But this arc suffers worse than any of the others from bad pacing. It's so long and nothing happens. My fiance and I could barely get through it, and we actually had to just outright skip some episodes from the recruitment portion of the arc because of how hard it was to focus on them. And the tournament honestly isn't much better. Like, there's a whole episode where they have to look for and crush a bug. It's awful. The series also just seems to have a vendetta against Boo, because once again he isn't able to fight and is taken off of the Universe 17. In his place we get Frieza, and to be fair, Frieza is entertaining in this arc, but I still would have liked to see Boo. He certainly would have been refreshing compared to most of the stoic, unexpressive characters on the Universe 17. Gohan, Krillin, 18, Piccolo, and Ten Shinhan are all so boring. Not in Z, and not necessarily in most of Super, but in this arc specifically. Like, honestly, I could not tell you a single thing that I remember them doing that I thought was cool, and it's pretty hard to think of any meaningful character differences between them as well. They're all written to be so flat, and are so uninteresting that when they're on screen, I just sigh and wait for one of the other characters with actual personality to show up and do something. Speaking of, I also can't tell you the names of a single character in the whole tournament that wasn't from Universe 6, Universe 7, or Universe 11. You know why this is all a problem? Because the arc has too many characters. Between the eight teams of ten fighters, the Gods of Destruction, the Kaioshin, all the Angels, the Grand Priest, and the two Zenos, there are 107 characters present on the stage. That is way too many characters for the Toei staff to handle, especially with a weekly release schedule like the one Super has. Most of these characters are incredibly forgettable, and the sheer amount that the series is forced to juggle causes some characters, ones that should actually be entertaining, to suffer in quality. This is, of course, without mentioning all the crazy power scaling problems this arc has, but I doubt I need to get into them. They are by no means the most serious issues with the Tournament of Power anyway, but boy how they sure are all over the place. Also, real quick, how come Hit couldn't use his constant improvement power when he fought Jiren in this arc? You'd think that would have been helpful. There is potentially a lot to say about this arc, but I feel like it's all fluff compared to the fact that I just think it's boring. What I think is weirder than anything, though, is everyone's reaction to Jiren. Of every character introduced to this arc, I think Jiren is the most competently written. Yes, he is bland and strong with no explanation, but that is the entire point. He is a brick wall who exists solely for the purpose of pushing Goku to his limits, and he does this well. I liked him more before he started talking a lot, though. Near the end of the arc, when he becomes more talkative, he starts to seem a lot more like an asshole. And yeah, his backstory is lame and kind of generic, but I think he's cool enough, and I think he is a much better character than just about everyone else introduced in the arc. Except this guy. Yeah. 